So tonight we're talking about the last pillar which we are yet to cover, um, which is al Qadr. Um, we had covered, you know, belief in Allah, belief in the prophets, belief in the angels, belief in the books, uh, belief in the, the the judgment, the hereafter, and the taqdeer or the qadr, which is the one that we um, are still to cover. So tonight, hopefully, we can do this. Um, from the very beginning, let me mention to you that this is one of those topics which <clears throat> uh, many of the scholars say that the humanity's uh, intelligence to understand and comprehend this part and aspect of Allah, it, it's not, we, or we don't have enough intelligence to be able to fully comprehend this. And so Al-Qadr sometimes remain a mystery for many people. Um, hopefully tonight you'll come out with some understanding of the basic concepts of it. Um, philosophies and many, many people over thousands of years have been trying to grapple with this topic. Um, even Muslims, they ended up actually disbelieving in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when they tried to delve in it because they could not find a clear understanding that will help them. And I think by the end of tonight's session, many of us will probably become even more confused than clear. So you may be going in tonight clear on the topic, and by the end of it, you may come out very confused. I will do my best to simplify it as much as I can, um, but bear in mind, it is one of those things which is very difficult for the average human being sometimes to grasp. Right? Um, many of the scholars have indicated that, you know, that the Qadr is like one of the secrets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So first thing is that they usually refer to Al-Qadr as Al-Qadha or al -Qadr. Um, They use these two words. So we need to be familiar with it because when you hear it being used, you at least know what it is because that's generally what they say, Al-Qadha or al Even though Qadr comes before al qadha but it rings it on the tongue better to say Al-Qadha or al -Qadr. So they put the, the al qadha first. Um, because it, it's smooth in the tongue, but technically Al-Qadr comes first and then Al-Qadr. So when these two years of words are used, they usually refer, they are used um, separately. If you say Al-Qadr or you say Al-Qadr, they really refer to the same thing. But if you're using them together, like you say Al-Qadr or Al-Qadr or Al-Qadr or Al-Qadr, then they have um, two slight different meanings. Al-Qadr means the predestination of things, and al qada means when those things become reality, then it's referred to as qada. So whatever is predestined is called al qadr And then when it happens and come to pass, then we refer to it as al qada. So you will hear this um, two terms. And so it is important to have an understanding of that. Now, as you know, it is an article of faith for Muslims to believe in al qadr you can't have any doubts about this. It's absolutely necessary. If you are going to be a Muslim, there are six articles of faith that you have to accept completely 100% or else you cannot be Muslim. So these six things, with, you know, these six beliefs must be accepted by all of us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, inna kulla shay'in khalaqnahu bi qadr. But verily, we have created all things with qadr, with predestination. So Allah indicated that everything in the creation has been created in this way. And the Prophet وسلم, when Jibreel asked him about Iman, the Prophet said, in reply to Jibreel, is a very famous hadith. It's in the second hadith of the 40 hadith collection of Nawawi that most people use and study from. The second one is called Hadith Jibril, in which Jibril came in the form of a man and sat with the Prophet and began to ask him questions about Islam, about Iman, about Ihsan, about the last hour and so on. And the Prophet answered those questions. And when he finished, the, he turned to the people and said, do you know who that was? And they said, we don't know. They said, that was Jibril who came to teach you your religion by asking me those questions and I answering them, this was Jibreel's way of helping all of you to understand these particular teachings. And so in reply to the question of what is Iman, 
the Prophet said, Iman is to believe in Allah, his angels, books, messengers, day of judgment, and Al-Qadr, the good and the bad. Khairihi wa sharru, the good of it and the bad of it. So part of Iman, which consists of these six things, um, Qadr is one of those. So we have to believe in the Al-Qadr. Um, there's another hadith, no, no slave of Allah will truly believe until he believes in Al-Qadr. It's good and bad from Allah. And good and bad, we'll, we'll, get, we'll clear that up later on what that means. Until he knows what has befallen him, was not going to miss him, and what was going to miss him was not going to befall him. So when the scholars look at Al-Qadr, the way they have approached the study of it is in relation to considering four things about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. First of all, Allah's knowledge. Secondly, after Allah's knowledge, they talk about Allah's writings. Thirdly, they talk about Allah's will. And fourthly, they talk about Allah's creation. So it's the knowledge, the writing, the will, and the creation. So the Qadr is discussed in these four categories. And so we will look at each one of them independently. So the first is Allah's knowledge. Our understanding of Tawheed helps us to understand that there's only one understanding about Allah, that Allah's knowledge encompasses everything. We as Muslims believe that Allah knows the past, the present, the future. He knows everything about his creation. And so this is something we cannot accept lesser than this. Allah tells us in the Quran, you know, in Allah bi kulli shayin alim. Verily Allah is the all knower of everything. So Allah in the Quran tells us, I know everything. And that Allah surrounds or comprehends all things in his knowledge. So the first very important concept for the Muslim to understand, we don't believe in a God who does not know some stuff. Or, you know, some stuff he knows and some stuff he doesn't. We believe in a God who knows everything. He knows everything about his creation. He knows the, what provisions they will get. He knows what lifespan they will have. He knows their sayings, their deeds, their secrets. He knows every leaf that is moving, every breath that you take. Allah knows everything. He also knows those who will be in the fire, those who will be in the heaven. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his knowledge encompasses completely everything. And so we begin by having this understanding that Allah knows which of us will end up in the hellfire and which of us will end up in the jahannam, I mean in the heaven and so on, because Allah's knowledge encompasses everything. So that's the first very critical concept. Now, the Prophet Ali said that the Prophet one day was sitting with a wooden stick in his hand. And here's where we're going to see some of the issues coming up. And he was scratching the ground with it. And then he raised up his head and he said, there is none of you but has its place assigned in the hell or the paradise. In other words, each of us have a place assigned in either paradise or hell. And they said, oh, Allah's messenger. If that is the case, why should we continue to carry on good deeds? Because if we have already been assigned a place in heaven and hell, you know, then we just let Qadr take his due course and give up doing anything constructive. Because if you know you're going to end up in one of these places anyway, why are you striving? Why are we wasting our time trying to do good deeds or bad deeds and so on? And the Prophet said, no, you are asked to carry on good doing good deeds because everyone will find it easy to do deeds that will lead him to what he has been created for. And then he recited the ayah that, you know, um, that those who give in charity keep their, you know, uh, their duty. That as for him who gives, who have taqwa and gives for the sake of Allah, then Allah will make his path to ease easy for him. And so uh, even though what has been... Uh, our place has already been assigned. We are asked to continue to do good deeds. Now, in terms of evil, you know, Allah mentioned in, in Surah Al-Falaq, uh, min sharra ma khalaq wa min sharra wa sikin idha waqab. 
and I seek refuge from the Lord of the daybreak. From the evil of what he has created. From the evil of what he has created. And so evil, Allah has always indicated that evil comes as a result of the activities of men. Evil has appeared on land and sea because of what the hands of men have heard. By oppression, evil deeds, and Allah make them taste of part of what they have done in order that they may return. So, in terms of pure evil, Allah is, does not create pure evil. Evil is a relative term because what may look as evil to one person may turn out to be a blessing for another, or for that, even that same person that may initially look evil. But evil does exist. And um, it is the manifestation of men. Allah doesn't have an attribute that says he is a creator of evil. You know, he has attributes, talks about creating good and, and goodwill and mercy. And he's merciful and kind and so on. He does not have that attribute of, of being evil. Now, as part of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is also has mentioned that Allah uh, has attributes of mercy. Allah, Allah created mercy. And the day he created it, he made it into 100 parts. And he withheld 99 part and sent one part to his creation. So all we have received is one of 99 parts of mercy. And if the unbeliever knew of all the mercy that Allah has in his hands, he would never lose hope of entering paradise. So we are encouraged that we should never lose hope of paradise because Allah has withhold 99 parts of mercy that he is ready to um, give to us. And so he will use on the day of judgment some of this mercy to allow many of us to get to paradise. The, so when there's a special dua that we uh, that is recorded in Bukhari in which we it's called, you know, the hadith of istikhar, in which when you're asking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that you, you place it in Allah's hands. So you said, oh, my Lord, I ask guidance. I ask your guidance due to your knowledge and appeal to you to help me due to your ability and ask you from your great favor. For you are able and I am not. You know and I don't. You know all hidden matters. Oh, Allah. If you know that this matter, and you name whatever matter it is, is good for me, you know, whatever it is you're making the decision on, or life, you know that this matter of whether I wanted to pass my exam, find a good spouse, you know, help my children to become Islamic, whatever it is, is good for me and my deed, my livelihood, the aftermath of any of my, mat of my matter, it's long term and short term, then decree it for me. Make it easy for me. Bestow his blessings on me. And if you know that this matter is bad for me, my deed, my life, the aftermath, the matter is long term and short term, then keep it away from me and turn it away from me and the good wherever it is and then content me with it. So this dua is in essence um, teaching us how to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala re regarding the matter of what is predestined for us that we put it in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the Abdullah ibn Umar said, the person asks Allah for guidance, Allah gives him. Whoever he turns angry, however he turns angry to his Lord, only to look at the aftermath and find that Allah indeed has chosen what is good for him. So there are two things which is referred to here, um, that before something happens, we remain hopeful. For example, your relative is sick and they are in bad shape. So you turn to Allah with hope because we don't know what is the decree of Allah. What is it that's going to happen in this circumstance? Is my cousin going to live or not? I don't know, but they're very sick. So what we are asked to do is to have hope in that Allah is going to allow my cousin to pull through. So we make dua, we make prayful, we, we, we turn to Allah and we beg in humility. 
if it turns out that the cousin gets well, then we say this was as the qadr of Allah and we are very happy with the result. If the cousin passes away, we said this was the qadr of Allah. You know, and we don't become angry with Allah. We say we trust in Allah's wisdom of why he has done that. So for the believer, both situations is very important for us to understand. Those who, when they make du'a to Allah for their, their sick cousin, and then the cousin passes away, they become angry. Why Allah allow him to, you know, we made all this du'a, and then he dug to die, and they become upset with Allah. This is part of the humiliation of Allah on that person. That you don't do that. That they, you, you have to, whatever happens, you have to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first concept we need to know is Allah knows everything. And we don't know anything about the future. So we have to trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Secondly, the right things of Allah. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. So... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who had the knowledge. And one, like when we say one thing about the knowledge of Allah, it is not like our knowledge. Our knowledge, we have a situation where we didn't know something and then we know. With Allah, there was not a, a situation where Allah didn't know and then he knew. Allah always knows. And then for us, knowledge we forget. Allah never forgets. So knowledge with Allah is something that he always know, knew and he never forgets never diminishes human being knowledge we don't know we then we know then we forget you know it's very different now the second concept that we need to grasp is the right things of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that knowledge that allah possess of everything that is going to happen all of the creation until the end of time allah knows allah has now written down that Al-Kitab, 50,000 years before the creation of the heaven and the earth, Allah wrote down everything about the creation. Okay, he wrote, wrote down everything uh, and it was placed in Lawul Mahfuz, which is that ta preserved tablet. Um, everything that is going to happen to everybody until the day of resurrection, uh, Allah has written down everything about what is going to happen uh, and so it's uh, the first important thing we need to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that alam ta'alam anna allaha ya'lamu ma fi s-sama'i wal ard inna zalika fi kitab inna zalika ala allahi yaseer that do, do you not know that Allah knows all that is in the heaven and earth. Verily, it's all in the book. Verily, that is easy for Allah. And the Prophet explained, Allah has written everything in due proportion 50,000 years before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Uh, and he has that recorded. So this is the first very important thing to understand that Allah has written down everything. Uh, Abi Hafsa uh, said to his son, uh, Ubadah ibn Samit said to his son, O son, you shall not get the true sense of Iman until you know that what has befallen you was not going to miss you and what missed you was not going to befall. I heard the Prophet say, as soon as Allah created the pen, he commanded it saying, write, it said, what should I write, my Lord? He said, write the record of all things to happen till the establishment of the hour. He said, oh, my son, I heard Allah's messenger saying, he who dies believing other than this is not from me. And so we have to have the understanding that Allah has written down everything that is going to happen till the day of judgment. And this uh, recording is... On the preserved tablet, Lawul Mahfuz. Now there's a second uh, recording that takes place. And uh, Umar al Khattab was asked about the ayah. And remember when your Lord brought forth the children of Adam from their loins, their seed. Uh, 
from Adam's loins. I made them bear witness as to themselves, saying, Am I not your Lord? They said, Yes. We testify lest you say on the day of the resurrection. Verily, we are unaware of this. So when the Adam was brought forth, the children of Adam at that time, uh, they were addressed and asked, if am I not your Lord? And they said, and they testified. And they said, yes. Um, and the messenger of Allah was asked about it. And he, he said, I, Allah, created Adam. Allah created Adam, and then he passed his right hand and brought forth from it his offspring, saying, I've created these for paradise, and they will do good deeds of the people of Jannah. Then he passed his hand again, and he says, I've created these for the hell, and they will do deeds of the people of the hellfire. Then a man asked, what is the use of doing any good? Allah's messenger said, verily, when Allah creates a slave for paradise, he uses him in doing good deeds for the people of paradise until he dies doing them upon which he will enter paradise. When he creates a slave for the hellfire, he uses it. Uh, his deeds that will do deeds that will merit him eventually going to the hellfire. Uh, Sheikh Albani, he, he said that this, this hadith will make people feel that we have no free will, that every, we have no choice, you know, but this is not really so. You know, that Allah is the one who is wise and, and makes these decisions that is beyond our capacity. And so um, this gets written uh, at the time of Adam, when Adam was, was created. So that's a second level of writing. First, you have the writing of everything, 50,000 years on the Lahul Mahfuz. Then you have the writing now when Adam was created. And was asked whether they, they believe in Allah and they accept it. Now we have a third level of writing, which happens when a person gets born. Uh, Abdullah bin Masood said, Allah's messenger uh, said, The creation of every one of you is collected for the first 40 days in the mother's womb in the form of a nutfa, after which it turns into an alaka for an equal period. And then it becomes a mudra. And for a similar period, then Allah sends his angels with four words recording the person's provision, uh, his lifespan, his deeds, and whether he will be wretched or he will be blessed. So, Ajali wa Amali wa Shaki, and I'll say. So, for a risk, wa riski wa Ajali wa Amali wa Shaki, and I'll say. And then he will breathe his soul into him, and then the person becomes. So, at the time of the birth of a person, um, these things get decided upon uh, at that time. So there's another writing here of this Qadr that takes place in when a person gets born, what kind of risk he will have, what, I mean, what kind of provision, what kind of lifetime he will be living, what kind of deeds he will have, and whether he will be a miserable person or a good person. And then there's a third uh, writing of, of Qadr again that happens every year. And this is mentioned in the ayah, you know, Fiha Yufriku Kulu Amrin Hakim. There in that night is decreed every matter of ordainment. And so on the Laylatul Qadr night, uh, the angels come down. And so the agenda for that person's life for the next year gets uh, recorded. And so uh, this is the yearly rec recording of. What is going to happen to that person? Who, whether they're going to die, whether they're going to get sick, whether they're going to, you know, whatever it is going to happen. And then there's a daily recording. All right. Um, whosoever in the heavens that are asked of him for his needs, every day he has a matter to bring forth. And the prophet says, every day he has a matter to bring forth that he may either forgive a sin for someone, lift the honor of someone. And so uh, there's a daily cutter of what happens to you. On a particular day. Now, the color for your daily, the color for your annual, and the color for you when you were born, these three uh, can be changed. But it does not conflict or contradict the one in the Lawul Mahfuz, which remains permanent and cannot be changed. So it's written in such a way that these are like details of that overall picture of what's going to happen to you.
Um, so your your annual, your uh, daily, and the lifespan can be changed. And there's Hadith the Prophet which he mentioned that when someone makes dua, it can change their qadr. For example, if someone treats their family properly, it can increase their lifespan and so on. So your your daily, weekly, and life qadr can be changed. Um, by doing some, some of these actions. Um, so that's the writings of Allah that gets recorded. Um, so these um, in the Lahul Mahfuz remains constant. The ones in the other three lower levels um, can change. Now the third understanding of Qadr it's concerning the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Mashiach Allah. And the understanding of this is that, that Allah is the one who has willed everything that happens in the world. But Allah has also allowed us to have a limited freedom of will in the world. So we have a limited freedom of will, but Allah's will overrides everything. So some of what we are asked and do in this dunya, some of it we don't have any will or control over. Like for example, you can't control uh, like sleep. You know, your body is just gonna take over. Allah has willed it such that sleep will just take over your body when it's time. You know, Allah has created you in such a way that you can't make a decision of whether to breathe or not. You know, if you stop breathing, you will die. So there are certain things that Allah has made part of his creation but then he has allowed us certain freedom you know so we have a limited will and in that is what Allah will test us Allah could have willed all of us to be like the angels and obey him every second but Allah in his mercy has allowed us to uh, have this limited will and to do even evil so there's there's two aspects to Allah's will which we'll come to. So first of all, uh, Allah has willed that we should get tests, we should get trials, we should be brought you know, before him, we should, uh, he will uh, judge us. And so Allah's will has determined that that's what he's going to do. He's going to, as he said, if I had willed and to make you one nation, he could have done that. He could have everybody become Muslim, but he didn't do that. So part of Allah's will is that he has allowed us to have limited free will. But anytime he can override our free will. So for example, you could get a book and read, but you will depend on the will of Allah to allow you to have access to that book. If it, Allah determined that I'm not going to give you access to that book, then you can exercise your will to read the book. So as we said, we plan and Allah plan, but Allah is the best of planet. So a lot of times uh, you... In your limited will, we don't control the results a lot of times. We control the effort, as we say. Now, Allah allows us and he allows the creation to do wrong and good. Allah created Satan, for example. Allah doesn't like what Satan does. Allah hates Satan. He hates people who, who disobey him. He hates kufr and all of that. But part of Allah's will is that he allows it to happen, even though he hates it. Because Allah wants the, the limited freedom of will to play out and allow humanity to have a chance to disobey or obey so that they can have proper judgment. And so even though Allah hates something, he allows it as part of his will to happen. And then there are some things which Allah allows to happen that he loves what we do. When a believer prays and does you know, acts of goodness, you know, it is also part of Allah's will. And he allows it to happen as well. And so this is a, um, Allah allowing us to have limited freedom to do within the dunya. Um, you could choose to eat or don't eat, sleep or don't sleep, pray or don't pray. You know, you, you have an opportunity to exercise your limited free will whilst you are staying in the dunya. But as he said, he does not like kuf, but he allows it. And the fourth part of the uh, discussion is concerning the creation of Allah. First of all, you need to know that Allah is the only creator in the whole of the universe. We don't have 
Allah creating good and Satan creating evil. Allah creates everything. And so even, as he mentions here, no, not a single atom or higher element of motion exists, but Allah creates it. Allah, nothing takes place in the world except, as he said, verily Allah is a creator of everything. Allahu khaliku kulli shay. That Allah is the creator of everything. Everything. And so um, this is a very important concept, which means that, as he said, that, say, O Muhammad, that Allah is the creator of everything and he is the one irresistible. So in all of his actions, there is a perfect wisdom. And we have to believe that Allah in making his creation um, has a wisdom behind everything he does. Now, when you in your limited freedom of will do something, like for example, you decide to act a particular way, that action gets created by Allah. If you decide to murder someone, that action has to be created by Allah. So Allah creates that action for you. That action of murder or whatever it is that you do, Allah allows you. Um, he creates that action, but it is your decision to murder this person. You will be held responsible. But Allah creates everything. So he will create that action for you. That's what you desire to do with your limited free will. Allah says you can, will we'll create that action for you to do. So if Allah stops it, then the free will goes away. So Allah has to allow free will, even though the action is something bad, Allah will manifest it because this is what the person and their free will have decided to do. Um, and so the, it is important that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in, when he created um, mankind, and as he indicated earlier, those actions, the evil of them is from humanity. Allah does not deliberately create evil for anything. It is evil, as he always mentioned, it is what the, the hands of humanity have brought that, that, you know, that will be um, tried. Now, there are a couple of sects in Islam that deviated because when they try to understand this concept, as I said, many people have been led astray by this understanding. It was a sect called Jabariya, and they decided that, you know, there is no free will. Based on all that they've read of the Hadith and the Prophet, they said, in essence, we have no free will. And everything is forced by Allah. Um, and there's a next group that says, the Qadariya, they said, look, we don't have any Qadar. Everything, have complete free will. But Allah doesn't interfere with nothing. And there's completely free will. And, you know, everything is by luck and, and you know, how we do it and so on. And the Prophet Sallallahu referred to them as, as, as the Majus or the, Maj the Magians of this Ummah. You know, that they, they, they believe Satan create evil and harmful things and that Satan is an equal co-creator with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, that takes them out to do it. Um, so, um, one second. So the middle course is the, the, the uh, Ahlul Sunnah well, followers. And what they uh, have, the Salaf al Salih, which we refer to them as Salaf al Salih, not, this is not Salafiyah, this is the, the people who follow the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet. Wasallam. They adopted a middle, middle course in that there is some uh, restricted restrictions to our will, but Allah has given us a limited free will. Um, so, in essence, what we have to do is before taqdeer takes place, you know, we are asked that, uh, so I don't know what's going to happen to me tomorrow. I don't know what's going to happen next week. So I can choose to say, you know what? I'm not going to do anything. The color of Allah is going to kick in anyway. We are told not to do that. We are told to continue to strive to our best and ask from Allah before something happens. We don't know what is in store for us. So we have to remain hopeful and asking from Allah and make an effort. That's it. the way you have those hadith of tidy camel and making effort and going forth and striving for the sake of Allah. So many ayahs in the Quran, Allah is 
continue striving, continue asking from Allah. Don't lose hope in the mercy of Allah. So before something happens, you've got to constantly appeal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But after something takes place, now that it has happened, you have to say, okay, I didn't really get what I wanted. Now I have to resort to saying, this was the qadr of Allah. Allah is wise. Allah has a reason why this didn't happen for me. Maybe it was not best for me. And you now have to give it a positive explanation of why this did not happen to you. But you must persevere patiently and continue to have taqwa. For then verily, this is from the great matters which you must hold on to Allah. Yeah. Some people, they take the qadr and try to blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is the one wanting this to happen. So I had no choice in it. And then you end up in this very bad place. And Allah has freed himself from anyone who tries to blame him for the qadr. Because he said, we have uh, those who took partners and worship Allah. If Allah had willed, we would not take partners. And I tried to blame Allah. And Allah said, we sent messengers to you. With glad tidings, we warned you what to do. We appealed to you. We didn't give you something beyond your capacity. We showed you both ways. You know, that and we guided you to two paths. You know, we give you the limited freedom to pick which one you would like. And we advise you to try to pick the one that is based on righteousness. So no one is going to come on the day of judgment and try to Blame that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was the one who forced them to make a decision. As one man came to Umar al-Khattab and he said, you know, um, he stole something. And uh, Umar, he came to Umar and he said, you know, when Umar was going to try to extract the punishment to cut his hand, he said, why are you punishing me? This was the qadr of Allah, you know. That it was such a beautiful argument, you know. Yeah, he, Omar Amir Mokmini, this, you know, I stole, but that was the cutter of Allah. And Omar turned to him and said, Well, you're about to see a next cutter of Allah as you cut your hand uh, for this punishment. You know, so you cannot conveniently use cutter of Allah like this. Before we look at the last part of the discussion about the benefits and merits of believing in a cutter, to summarize back. Um, this very difficult topic. So first of all, we need to know that Qadr is compulsory to believe in our Qadr. Number one, right? So this is part of the articles of faith to become a Muslim. You cannot not accept the reality of our Qadr, which means the predestination of things. Number two, uh, in order to understand our Qadr, it is compulsory on us to accept it. And it's based on four understandings about Allah. One, that Allah knows everything before it happens. It's like he's seen the movie before. If you look at someone who's watching a movie the second time, and someone watching the movie the first time, the person who's seen it before can say, you know, look, look, he's going to hit him now. He's going to do this now. Like, How do you know that? Well, I've seen this movie before. For me, it's, I've, I've, I can tell you everything. But it doesn't mean I'm influencing the person in the movie. I'm just telling you what's going to happen. So Allah knows everything. Number two, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knowledge is, is about, he not only knows what is going to happen in the past, what is going to happen in the future, what is going to happen in the present. Allah even mentioned that there will be people in Yom al Qiyamah that will say, oh Allah, send me back. You know, and I will do good deeds when they see the reality what's going to happen in Yom al Qiyamah. Some of them will say, could you please send me back? And Allah says to them, if I was to send you back and you were to go back, this is what you would do. So even theoretically, Allah knows, hypothetical what didn't happen. That if I was to send you, this is what he's going to do. This is what you're going to do and so on. So Allah's knowledge is truly uh, encompassing. Secondly, you know, after believing in Allah, that Allah writes down everything he knows in several recordings, there's 50,000 years before the creation, Allah recorded everything that's going to happen until Yom al -Qiyamah. And then uh, when the son of Adam was born and the children of Adam, Allah took an oath and commitment from them that they testify they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That gets written down. Then when a person gets born, 
the four things gets written down about them, the length of their lifespan, what kind of sustenance they will get, whether they will be happy or sad, and whether uh, the actions, what kind of actions they will do. That can change based on doa and striving. And then there's a yearly uh, agenda of what happens to you in the coming year that gets brought down and Laylatul Qadr. And that is written down as well. And that can be changed as well. And then there's a daily agenda that gets of what's going to happen to you tomorrow um, for the rest of the day until the next 24 hours. That can change as well. And then they have the will of Allah. That Allah has everything you see in the world is because of the will of Allah. Allah allows it to happen. And he has given us limited free will. And in that free will, we can choose to disobey Allah, to curse Allah. We can choose to do good or bad, and Allah allows it. He has a broader will, but he allows us to do that. And in that, he will test us and judge us. And lastly, the, Allah is the creator of everything. And so in your limited free will, when you decide to do something, Allah is the one who has to create that action good or bad. And so that's why we said the qadri wa sharri, the good and the bad of it. That, you know, Allah will manifest that because he's allowed that to happen for you. He has created Satan and he allows Satan to continue to try to misguide humanity because he's given free will for them to do for a period of time. And so now we come to some of the benefits of a qadr. One, it gives you peace of mind because after something happens, you don't sit there, you know, and you, if, for example, something didn't happen to you, you know, you, 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 you have a sense of, you know, the understanding that anything that's going to happen to you or happen, anything that's going to miss you will miss you. So you don't have to, ha you know, you, you have that certitude that it will not ever hit you. And then it don't make you grieve about something that happened. You don't go back and say, oh God, if I had done such and such, this will not happen to me. We don't think like that. After something has happened, we say this was the qadr of Allah. There was nothing I could do or could have done to prevent that. It already happened. Once it has happened, then you don't have that, 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 that thinking that a lot of people, when they, for example, when they have close relatives die, they study, oh, I wonder if I did enough for that person and that and that, and if I could go back in time. The Muslims don't spend a lot of time doing that. Once something has happened, we say it is a color of Allah and we move on. Then it gives you the power and determination to go forward, you know, because you don't frighten anything. You don't have any fear because what is going to happen is going to happen. What's going to miss you is going to miss you. So, you know, as the hadith of the Prophet said, the whole nation was together to benefit you. They're only going to benefit what Allah has decided. And if they're going to harm you, they're only going to harm you what Allah has decided. And so you don't, you don't operate with this sense of fear. It teaches you to be very brave and strong. And then it teaches you to be humble and modest because you know everything that you're doing is by the will of Allah. It's not because of your smarts or your degree or your wealth. It is Allah who has decreed this, you know, who has allowed this to happen to you. And so you, you develop a sense of modesty. All my degrees and all my accomplishments is not because of me. It is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decided that that is what I should get. You know, so it, it makes you very humble. And then it causes you to have a total dependence on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, because um, everything they, 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 is, is based on the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the success lies in putting your trust in Allah. We have to return to Allah. Allah is the one telling us to try to do good. Allah is the one giving us the freedom of will to do so. And so everything revolves around, you know, trying your best with your limited life to strive to become and to um, solicit the mercy of Allah. Take precautions as everybody is guided to that which has been destined to. So you should do as much good as you can and put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah mentions when good comes to you, it's from Allah. But when evil comes, it is from yourself. You know, the Prophet says, when good comes to you, it is from Allah. And whatever comes, you know, um, other than that, it is from what your hands have produced. And so as I began this session, I said, 
I may confuse you more than um, providing enlightenment, but hopefully um, it is one of those things which many of the scholars said is really beyond the, the understanding of uh, regular human beings um, to fully grasp the concept of Qadr because it is something that belongs to the knowledge of Allah. Um, but hopefully there's some small way um, I have managed to at least give you some idea of the topic and um, that will allow you. So just keep striving, keep putting your trust in Allah and use every day that you have to do as much good deeds as you can and you will not be um, you know, you'll be in good shape. Jazakallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.